We're now on track to have enough vaccine supply for every adult in America by the end of May. U.S. President Joe Biden announcing a breakthrough in vaccine availability amid concerns that some states may be lifting restrictions too soon. Hello, I'm Mike Walter sitting in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. The announcement that vaccines will be available ahead of schedule came as welcome relief to Americans, but it came with a warning from the CDC not to loosen restrictions. While the country has hit a plateau in coronavirus cases and deaths, concerns remain about variants and complacency that could cause a spike in cases. For more, we turn now to CGTN's Nathan King. So, Nathan, a mix of optimism and some caution from the Biden administration, and yet some states are still moving ahead with plans to fully open up and lift these mass mandates. Yeah, it's the same old story with COVID-19 in the United States, isn't it? One step forward, one step back. I'm here on Capitol Hill, where we're hoping for the shot in the arm, of course, for the $1.9 trillion relief bill. A lot of it will be uh, used for uh, COVID rollout, especially vaccines. But there is hope. I mean, uh, as you know, uh, it looks like uh, vaccinations are really picking up. Uh, over 2 million a day in the last uh, 24 hours, the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine, uh, as you've said. But then we see states like Texas and Mississippi deciding to lift mask mandates and others very, very quickly despite the spread of these variants. And also some indication from the CDC that cases may be leveling off but not falling uh, as quickly. Uh, you know, and Joe Biden, uh, the president, has uh, reacted to some of these states, calling them Neanderthal. Uh, but he is basically saying, look, while there is light at the end of the tunnel, and we can probably vaccinate or have enough vaccines for everyone by the end of May, caution is still required, but hope is on the horizon. Let's take a listen. Two of the largest healthcare and pharmaceutical companies in the world that are usually competitors are working together on the vaccine. Johnson & Johnson and Merck will work together to expand the production of Johnson & Johnson's vaccine. Right now, an entire generation of young people is on the brink of being set back a year or more in their learning. We want every educator, school staff member, child care worker to receive at least one shot by the end of the month of March. So basically, uh, that opening schools is very important because they said they would open schools within the first 100 days, but they are probably going to be behind that in the administration. There's lots of negotiations up and down the countries with teachers unions, etc. But getting shots in the arms of all the educators uh, will help. Uh, the problem is, is that even though over 2 million people are being vaccinated a day here, it's still slow and patchy. Here in Washington, D.C., it's very hard uh, to get a shot, I can tell you from uh, personal experience, and it's very patchy although it is a lot better than it was. Uh, the Biden administration said there was no plan under the Trump administration and they're playing catch up. And Nathan, there's this report out in the Financial Times that the Biden administration is now in talks with Japan, yeah. India and Australia to distribute COVID-19 vaccines in Asia. It's part of a strategy to counter China's influence. This comes at a time when then there are those out there calling for global cooperation to defeat the virus. In just a few minutes, we'll be joined by Chung Lee of the Brookings Institution to discuss an article he just wrote yeah. about the need for the U.S. and China to cooperate to stop the pandemic. I wanted to get your thoughts. Are there competing views in the administration or do they all see this as a potential area of competition. Well, I mean, it depends how you look at it, isn't it? You could look at it as competition, but you also look at it as more vaccine. Uh, I think, uh, uh, obviously, there's a, a political uh, uh, view here. Uh, Kurt Campbell, who's the uh, uh, main driver of the uh, uh, idea of working with the so-called Quad, and we're talking about Japan, India, Australia, uh, and the U.S. to roll out uh, vaccines from the West, uh, do understand that China and Russia have rolled out many more uh, shots to developing world and, and, and neighboring countries than the U.S. has, uh, even though they may not have vaccinated as many people at home. But at the same time, isn't it good that uh, the U.S. is now finally looking to uh, send vaccines abroad as well? Uh, remember, under the Trump administration, they pulled back uh, from, uh, uh, from the WHO. They weren't part of the COVAX initiative. Now they're in. 
uh, more vaccines in more arms may not be seen necessarily by everyone as competition. And let's face it, the U.S. is late to the game. Uh, you've seen all over Chinese media and, uh, and global media uh, the, the fact that China is delivering vaccines from Serbia to Swaziland uh, and will continue to do so. So uh, they're ahead of the game. Uh, the real question is, uh, will there be enough? Uh, as you know, uh, a lot of this is aid, but a lot of it is also paid. Uh, and a lot of developing countries just can't afford it. And as we know with this pandemic, uh, borders don't matter, state borders don't matter, whatever Texas and Mississippi decide. And in the end, it's one humanity fighting a bug that essentially doesn't distinguish us at all. Yep, doesn't know red or blue. Uh, Nathan King, thanks so much. That is Nathan King uh, reporting for us. But there's a lot to get to. Uh, let's get to our panel right off the bat. Chris Smith is a consultant virologist at the University of Cambridge and the co-presenter of the Naked Scientist podcast. Joseph Williams is a senior news editor with U.S. News and World Report. William Hazeltine is the chair and president of Access Health International and the author of Variants, The Shape-Shifting Challenge of COVID-19. And Chung Lee is the director of the China Center and a senior foreign policy fellow at the Brookings Institution. He's also out with this really thoughtful argument on why the United States and China should be working together to stop the pandemic. Uh, but this is a relationship, as you know, that's, that's quite uh, troublesome. The motives often are questioned. Uh, let's listen to the spokesperson for the CPPCC, Guo Weimin. Uh, I also noticed that certain people have claimed China is using vaccines to expand our geopolitical influence. This idea is extremely narrow-minded. Vaccines are an important tool to control the coronavirus pandemic, and it is also currently an important measure used by the international community collectively. China has committed to making vaccines globally available, supporting domestic businesses to work with related countries in vaccine R&D and production. We have joined the WHO's global vaccine sharing scheme, COVAX, to positively promote promote the fair distribution of the vaccine across the world. So, Chung Lee, this is one of your suggestions that the United States and China team up, uh, get these vaccines out uh, across the world. Um, and yet we're seeing kind of this this view of this as a competition. Give me your sense about why it's so important for these two major powers to work together on this. Well, first of all, the words safe, effective and the universal vaccine. Uh, this is an absolutely shared interest for both countries. Now, the United States and China are two of the very few countries with manufacturers that have produced vaccines. They should uh, engage in positive competition rather than in zero-sum game. They certainly should overcome the so-called vaccine nationalism and the xenophobic thinking and also the Cold War kind of mentality. Uh, they should work together to promote effective vaccine platforms and prevent adverse uh, reactions. Now, also we know that uh, uh, China and United States are the two countries for, cu uh, for uh, cumulative and average daily number of vaccine administrators. These are leading countries. But we, we still do not know that whether the distribution is enough for both countries for herd immunity uh, by the you know, middle or the end of 2021. But more importantly, is for global distribution because uh, as for global pandemics such as COVID-19, as often said, no country is safe until everyone is safe. So therefore, the global distribution of vaccine is crucial. Now, United States and China have complementary strengths and capacities, and the U.S.-China collaboration can contribute and enhance to uh, multilateral initiatives, especially for developing countries. Bill, he makes some great points here. Uh, you've worked uh, with a number of countries, including China. Where does geopolitical competition end and cooperation begin? Well, this is a uh, global problem. And I can say from the research front, uh, trying to understand the virus, understand what can be done to control it, uh, there is total transparency or near total transparency and almost in instantaneous communication. That should be uh, the model. I think many of the people who've spoken already talked about the issues that this is a world problem, a problem someplace is a problem every place. I think I'd like to add another perspective. This is not going to go away soon. We're going to be dealing with this year after year, as far as we can tell now, sort of like the influenza. So what we do now isn't going to be the end all and be all. This is a long term game and we should be prepared 
for the virus to counter our moves, as it is already doing. That is going to require surveillance on a global scale, because what happens in a distant community we know can happen in a new community. There will be resistance to the vaccines that come out today. We will have to have surveillance and we'll have to have that knowledge. A world that is fully informed, that works together to solve our common problem, will be a much healthier world. So I don't just see it as a U.S.-China. I see it as India as a major vaccine producer. You know, over half the vaccines in the world are produced in India today. And they are just coming online just now. One of their companies was just approved for a different type of vaccine. So I think we have to look at this as a global problem. And I point out something else. There is existing a global shortage of vaccine manufacturers. You can count on one hand or less, even a few fingers of one hand, how many manufacturers there are on two major continents, Africa and South America. We need to increase overall vaccine manufacturing capacity. That's a job for AAIB. That's a job for the World uh, Bank. That's a work bank, uh, job for many of the uh, development banks around the world. So there's a lot of work to do. As I say, this is going to be with us for a long time, and we have to be prepared for the world working together to not just control this, but to eradicate this from the human population. Yeah, we'll dig a little dip deeper into uh, variants and surveillance just a little bit later. But, Chris, I want to get to you. Uh, there's talk in the European Commission, commission rather, about uh, introducing some legislation called a digital green pass. This would give uh, COVID-19 vaccine recipients a chance to actually travel. Some people say it's discriminatory against some of the people who don't have easy access to vaccines. Talk to us about this legislation and also give us a sense of what the pandemic's doing in Europe. Uh, just to respond to one of the, the prior points as well, and just to disabuse people of the notion, it will be impossible to eradicate this virus. And the reason it's impossible to eradicate this virus is because it has come to us from nature, as far as we know. It's an animal virus that's jumped the species barrier. And when you have an animal reservoir like that, you just can't get rid of it. And so that's why we know that we're in this for the long game. This is going to take a lot of future planning and we've got to have measures in place that enable us to plan for having this virus around, knocking on our doors for the foreseeable future. Now, one way to do that is, of course, with very, very stringent public health measures, with testing and keeping an eye on who's got virus, where it's going and how the virus is changing, doing surveillance so that we can effectively keep the spotlight on the virus and not just in one territory, in every territory. Now, that might sound alarming, but actually we've been doing that for the flu for many decades, and we do it very well. And there's a vast network across the world who collect samples. I helped to run one of them. We send those samples into an, uh, an even more powerful network, and they slowly assemble a picture of how the virus is changing and evolving as it goes around the world to inform how we're going to vaccinate people in the forthcoming winter. I think we have an excellent model there through which we can plan for how we're going to control the coronavirus going forward. In the near term, though, while we do still have high levels of virus circulating in countries, the risk of there being disclosed in those areas, a variant or variants that have the ability to surmount either the herd or population level immunity that people have already accrued or the protection conferred by vaccination remains a very real prospect. And for that reason, we need to have some kind of measure in place to see where people are going and when people do travel, that they're not carrying one of those variants or that they're protected from variants that they might encounter when they get to these different geographies. And that's the whole stance behind some kind of vaccine passport idea. But to make this agile and efficient, rather than just a piece of paper we staple into a passport, we have something which is electronic and it's, it's accessible, decodable, comprehensible and generalizable across the world. And, and that needs a bit of thought and at the moment, actually, it's not simple because we don't know really what immunity to this virus means. I've had a Pfizer vaccine as a healthcare worker in the UK, uh -huh. but actually, I don't know how long I'm going to be immune for. I don't know if I'm immune to all the different variants. I don't know when I'm going to need another booster. And for that reason, actually, if I did have a piece of paper stamped into my passport, what should it say? Should it say Chris Smith is protected for six weeks, six months or six years? 
At the moment, we don't know, and therefore, it's very much at the planning stage. Yeah, and a lot of, lot of questions still need to be answered. Uh, Joseph, there is some optimism out there, though. Uh, we started off with uh, the president talking about uh, some of the developments just this week. Uh, of course, Merck working with Johnson & Johnson to uh, get more of these vaccines out there. He's talking about teachers being inoculated by the end of this month and, and all American adults uh, being potentially vaccinated by the end of May. But the head of the CDC does have some words of caution. Let's listen. I am really worried about reports that more states are rolling back the exact public health measures we have recommended to protect people from COVID-19. I understand the temptation to do this. 70,000 cases a day seems good compared to where we were just a few months ago. But we cannot be resigned to 70,000 cases a day, 2,000 daily deaths. Please hear me clearly. At this level of cases with variants spreading, we stand to completely lose the hard-earned ground we have gained. These variants are a very real threat to our people and our progress. Now is not the time to relax the critical safeguards that we know can stop the spread of COVID-19 in our communities, not when we are so close. Joseph, uh, you don't get the sense that the governor of Texas or Mississippi are taking this into account uh, from a political standpoint. How difficult is this to manage? Now, it's going to be extremely difficult because we don't have a national protocol. We don't have one set, uh, one set rule for everyone. And uh, because we're so polarized as a nation, because the hyperpolarization has taken root in places like Texas and Mississippi, it's going to be extremely difficult to bring this virus to heal completely. Uh, and uh, as one of your former uh, guests said, we're likely to be living with this for quite some time. Now, look, I mean, it's understandable. Uh, I echo the, the CDC director in saying that it's understandable. You understand why people want to get moving forward. You understand from an economic standpoint, from a political standpoint, that we need to get going as a nation. However, she is absolutely right. Texas, a thousand, a couple thousand cases per day, a couple of hundred deaths per day. Those are still real people, real lives being lost to this virus, and a healthcare system that is just now recovering from the surges of cases that we had over the holidays. And keep in mind that not only are the cases still there, and they are still uh, being people are still being infected, still dying. We run the risk of having a second surge that would further tax the healthcare system and have even more uh, pressure put on exhausted healthcare workers. So while President Biden has a lot of good news to share, it is going to be difficult to get these other states to follow suit and to understand that we're not at the finish line just yet. And that is a political problem that is, that is turning into a public health problem that it seems like we can't afford just yet. Yeah, uh, Chung Lee, let me ask you about one of your other suggestions in your Brookings column, which is uh, the resumption of public health cooperation between the U.S. and China and retaining these strong ties within the medical community. We did see an example of that yesterday, this virtual gathering where you had the top epidemiologists in the U.S. and China together. It was University of Edinburgh put this together. Is that a good first step? And talk to us about, it seems as though all these relations between the United States and China have been frayed over the last four years. Is this, is this a good starting point? Well, certainly, um, you know, despite the political barriers and uh, undermine government cooperation that uh, hurt the, the medical community for cooperation, medical experts and scientists on both sides of the Pacific have to preserve extensive, strong, and dynamic communication and the collaboration throughout the COVID-19 crisis. Now, in fact, experts in the U.S. and China have cooperated on coronavirus research more with each other than with any other country. Now, this is evident uh, in a number of areas. I just wanted to uh, single out of two. One is that uh, uh, scientists and medical experts in both countries uh, published joint research paper uh, in leading journals, more so uh, last year and than any time, than double uh, uh, you know, the previous years. Now, also that you mentioned about the webinars uh, that uh, conducted jointly uh, participated by both, um, you know, uh, uh, scientists in both countries. Now, uh, uh, you mentioned about the example of the Brookings meeting that uh, Dr. Zhong Nansan, the head of the expert group of the China's National Health Commission, and the Dr. Ian Lipkin, known as the uh, virus hunter, uh, Professor Columbia, they participated in that uh, event, Brookings Tsinghua University event. But just uh, also yesterday, Dr. Zhong Nansan and also Dr. Anthony Forge appeared on a webinar 
called, uh, co uh, uh, hosted by a Chinese university and the American medical school. Now, this gave a lot of confidence and also hope uh, for you know the joint effort to overcome that challenge. So it's really a contrast on the government level. It's lack of uh, commitment, uh -huh. lack of communication, and uh, usually point finger to each other. Right. But on the medical and, and uh, uh, scientific areas, you see the just the opposite. Right. There's a very strong ties uh, still remain. Right. Uh, Bill, let's talk more about variants because you brought it up. You've written a book about it. Uh, Pfizer's exploring ways to combat them. Moderna has uh, already tweaked its vaccine. It still needs to be tested, of course. Which one of these variants seems the most threatening to you at this point? Well, I've uh, actually just updated uh, the book. It'll be coming out uh, for what's happened in the month of February, which has been quite eventful. Uh, it's hard to say right now which is the most dangerous. Some spread better. Some evade immune response better. And we're just beginning to get the full measure of what these variants are. As uh, February unfolded, there was at least one and sometimes two new variants that popped up, significant variants that were shown by epidemiologists to spread much more rapidly than the previous uh, uh, variants. Some of these variants are more deadly uh, than others. They're going to be a big problem. I think the way you have to think about it, and I've been looking at the question a lot more deeply now, you have to look at it kind of like the flu, that there are two things going on. And somebody pointed out earlier that immunity, even vaccinated immunity, isn't going to last forever. And these viruses, flu viruses and uh, the coronaviruses, behave pretty much like each other and not at all like polio. You get polio or you get a polio vaccine, you're protected for life. You get coronaviruses and they come back the same viruses with some variation the next year. So the variants are going to be with us and they can vary in many ways. If you actually look at the extent of possible variation by looking at other members of this family and just look at what's already happened, you see enormous variation, uncountable numbers of uh, variants that each one is going to have its own characteristic. So it depends upon exactly how it's interacting with the people. It depends exactly how it's interacting with the vaccine. I don't think that any vaccine is going to be durable and protective against most of these variants. And I don't think we're going to be able to play catch up. We've never done it with the flu. Hmm. The flu vaccines vary from year to year from 30 percent to 60 to 70 percent protection. Uh, I think we can do better. But it's the, the one hope that we've seen is if you can get the vaccines to immunize people to a very high level, you get pretty good protection against the variants. But how long that's going to be maintained is hard to say. Yes. This is a big unknown. Yes. It's going to be a big problem. Yeah, it's a, long time. it's a big, big question. Uh, Chris Politico is out with a, a new poll from Europe. People in Germany, France, and Sweden blaming the EU for its handling of the pandemic and the vaccine rollout. In the UK, 45% say that Brussels has done a bad job. Austria and Denmark unhappy with the slow vaccine rollout. They're now working with Israel to come about with some second generation vaccines. Talk to us about the vaccination process in Europe. Why the hiccups? Where does it stand now? Well, there's something of a comparison going on between the performance of the UK vaccine initiative and what happened across the EU and continues to happen across the EU. Now, this actually goes back to last year when uh, Britain decided not to join a consortium. The EU decided to purchase vaccines as a block. Their rationale for doing that was that they could buy at scale and they could therefore achieve economies of scale and have more purchasing power and a buyer's advantage. The UK said no thanks, and people criticised the UK for deciding to go its own way, but actually it turned out to be the right thing to do. The UK was very agile. It had a small group of people who had enormous decision-making powers. They chose very carefully from what they, they thought accurately and correctly would be the front runners in the vaccine race and put in very big orders very early. The EU did what the EU do very well, which is bureaucracy with three pluses after it, and they vacillated for ages and put their order in eventually quite late in the day and then were very surprised when those companies didn't deliver uh, mm -hmm. at the timeline that the EU were expecting. There have also been other delays. The European Medicines Agency, EMA, have been quite slow in approving the vaccines that have subsequently been approved and people are quite rightly saying, well, why is that? And so really the EU faces the humiliation of the fact that uh, they were slow off the mark 
they have been slow to vaccinate their population and they've still got most of the populations in single figures of percentage yes. in terms of people mm. being vaccinated. The UK now close to one in three adults who's received at least one dose of vaccine. And then you've got those very damaging uh, outbursts from Emmanuel Macron saying that the AstraZeneca vaccine approved by the Europeans' own regulator was quasi ineffective in older people data very strongly refuted by studies now emerging from the UK, from Public Health England, from Israel. Yeah. And then Angela Merkel asked, will you have this vaccine? And she gave a very subtle politician's answer and said, yeah. oh, I'm too old for that, yeah. which was just a stupid thing to say, because the message coming out loud and clear is, don't have this if you're older. Right. When in fact, the data say, have this vaccine, have any vaccine if you're offered one, your chances of succumbing right. to coronavirus are much higher than if you have this vaccine and it protects you. Well, let me, uh, let me ask Chung Lee, uh, and we're kind of running out of time, we've probably got a couple of minutes right now. One of the other suggestions you have in, in your column is that uh, these two main powers work together for a global surveillance network for variants. This is something that uh, Bill talked about earlier as well. Very important. How do they go about doing this? Well, uh, last year provided a serious lesson for everyone because uh, both China and the United States have engaged in a blame game, fought uh, propaganda wars, and uh, promoted the conspiracy theories very kind. Now, uh, this is actually a contrast from, uh, to the history that uh, over the past 40 years, at least, China and the United States government have a long history of collaborating to combat virtually every global health crisis. Uh, you know, including uh, HIV, uh, AIDS, SARS, and uh, 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 Ebola, and etc. So I think this is the the the, the norm, and but the unfortunate last year has been an uh, exception. So I think that uh, as the pandemic entered the second year with new variants emerging uh, around the world, as uh, Bill just uh, mentioned, there's uh, still time to alter the uh, narrative, and also with the new president. Uh, in, in the White House, I think it gives some kind of opportunity. We should not miss that opportunity for get to the right track. And, and do you think it's likely? Briefly, we've well, got about I 20 hope, seconds. I think there's some indication that uh, because uh, uh, Biden put that as a top priority and the Chinese certainly react, uh, you know, it, it should be global effort. Yeah. As the early speakers mentioned, Bill, speaker men Bill mentioned, that there's only global recovery. There's no such a thing called national it, recovery. Exactly. Uh, very good point. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. Uh, that's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Mike Walter in Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for watching.